much of the Urantia book would not appeal to Simon Peter. But all of it would have appealed to John Zebedee. Because John Zebedee had the theological mind among the twelve. John was 23 years of age when he started to follow after Jesus. I can remember that date very well because I was exactly 23 years of age when I first read the Jesus papers. And naturally, chronology-wise, I identified with John. John was the youngest of the apostles. Most of them were around 30. Jesus was one of the older ones. He was 32, and I think the oldest, save Andrew, who was 33 when they started out. I wish you would stop and think about that age spread from 23 to 33. When they were through, John was 27 and Andrew was 37. And they had finished Jesus' public ministry. Jesus was 32 when he took off. He, no one would pay, everyone would think he was too young to do anything today. But most of the 12 were younger than Jesus. Speaking of age, uh, it tickles me. Down east, we had some years ago, we had to remove a vice president because he was wrecking the operation of a flat steel factory. And there was only one chap who could step in and run this product division. I'm sorry that this guy was 29 years of age, but that's all the longer he'd lived. And I went back to corporation with my recommendation. And I got terrible opposition from the brass. In fact, he just wasn't going to get the job. And then I turned to the old chairman of the board, who was then well into his 60s. And I said to him, we'll call him Joe. I happen to know the history of this company. I said, Joe, how old were you? when you became vice president and general manager of this company when this whole company was about the size of this division. And my pal Joe looked at me, blushed, and stopped talking because he was 28, a year younger than this guy. Did you know it? I knew this, yes. It was a mean trick. It was a very mean trick. But it was high time that Joe remembered his past. I think Jesus got these men at their peak of creativity. When I was in my 20s and early 30s, I was pretty sure that I was more creative than most of my elders. Looking back, and from my present vantage point, I know now that I was then right. I have what's left. I have the threadbare remnants of a once creative mind to work with. But it used to be real creative. I think it's a good thing to remember the age group here. We're prone to forget it. John, John had an overblown ego. Uh, he joined the Twelve. Of all of the Twelve, he had the best opinion of himself. Contact with Jesus reasonably cured him of this ego. But when he was an old, old man, and he mustn't be held to blame for this, the old boy was nearing senility. He was almost a hundred years old when he dictated the fourth gospel to a Greek amanuensis. And the ego had come back on him at that time. And he did not hesitate to refer to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. Well, if he'd said an apostle whom Jesus loved, it would have been all right because he loved them all. As the papers point out, John was the apostle whom Jesus trusted. Jesus trusted John with such affairs of his private life as he could not personally attend to. When he, when he left for Rome, it was with John that he left his money. It was John who purchased the home that Mary and Jesus' sister Ruth lived in, in Capernaum. It was to John that he committed the care of his mother, when he was dying. If John had an ego, John also had another quality, which was courage. The only other one of the twelve, I think, who had a courage that equaled John's was Thomas. 
John had a chill steel courage. He was unafraid to take a chance. He was the only one of the twelve who was with Jesus. Of course, he was there by invitation. He went right through everything. And the only thing Jesus didn't trust him to see was the indignation which he suffered at the hands of the servants of the high priest. He sent John out of the room. He feared for John's life. James is an interesting character. It's too bad he didn't live because he was with Matthew, runner up to Peter, in terms of the ability to handle the crowd. James was, James had a real grasp of Jesus' teachings. He and John both had a temper. You recall? <laughs> Samaritans were disrespectful. They wanted Jesus to really invoke his powers and let's blast these beatniks. Let's, let's call down fire and thunder on their impious heads. <coughs> James liked discretion, not courage. Jesus never commissioned any of the twelve to make private investigations of the life of Herod Antipas, his sex relations, and so forth. This was not a part of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. But James let his indignation carry him away, divert him from teaching the gospel into taking off after Herod. And Herod had him arrested and tried and beheaded. But he died in such a courageous manner that the person who informed on him joined the followers of Jesus. All of these people died bravely. Peter was crucified. Andrew was crucified, James was beheaded. Only John died of old age. And you recall it's a sweet it's a sweet picture they paint of the old bishop of Ephesus when he was too old and feeble to walk and they carry him out in a chair for a long, long time in his last years. All he would say to the congregation was, My little children, love one another. That's quite that's quite a long ways from calling down thunder and lightning. These four men, I think, uh, did the most for the early gospel. These were the four men that were closest to Jesus, whom he personally picked. They were all, save James, effective. And if James had, had been more discreet, he would have been more effective. These were men of considerable ability. Philip and Nathaniel they encountered on the way up from the encampment of John the Baptist. Philip is the type of person who is a very intriguing person. Philip was an excellent administrator. Philip, you'll recall, was the steward of the Twelve. He was the quartermaster department of the Twelve. Philip would draw on Judas and would purchase supplies and keep things in order. And very few times did he ever fall down. You remember just before the feeding of the 5,000, Philip was really on pins and needles because he just didn't see where the food was coming from. And that worried him. Philip had no ability to visualize. He was not unintelligent, but he was completely prosaic in terms of creative imagination. Philip could not project. Philip always wanted to be shown. Uh, his was not the questioning mind which Thomas had. His was a mind which simply could not put two and two together in the abstract and deduce four. You'll recall the rather touching remark that it was after the resurrection that he went home and baptized his whole family. He had been shown. Philip had a real courage, though. When he met his end, they nailed him to a cross, and he wouldn't stop preaching. And when he died, his wife took it up. And when they killed her, their daughter went up. Philip was traveling with Nathaniel, and after he had 
responded to Jesus' suggestion that he follow him, he too was a missionary, and he went and spoke to Nathaniel. I like Nathaniel. Nathaniel replied with a wise crack, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I think there'll be a perfect parallel as this book spreads around, can any good thing come out of Chicago? Nazareth was a town with not too high a reputation. It was a communication center, just like Chicago. Nathaniel, I feel the closest to of any one of the twelve. Uh, the questions Nathaniel asked are questions which I might have asked, I think. Nathaniel was a philosopher. He was no Simon Peter. Nathaniel was a teacher, not a preacher. I think he had perhaps the highest intellectual grasp of Jesus' teachings. There were things which Jesus told him, which he admonished and, and admonished him to tell no man. Jesus trusted Nathaniel with the truth about the scriptures. Nathaniel had, I think, along with his the asset of his humor, Nathaniel had a great fault. He was a poor organization man. The story of Nathaniel's wasted mission has been of great help to me because, this may surprise you, I'm, I pitch for the Arantia Brotherhood. It's very difficult for me to work with an organization. And I think except for knowing about Nathaniel, I too could drift off to India because that would be my nature. This is what I would like to do if I were simply left to my own devices. But I don't choose to waste my efforts, and I think Nathaniel wasted his efforts. I think when Nathaniel left, there was no one left to check Simon Peter. Nathaniel, I think, was the last hope of retaining the gospel of Jesus without the rigidity which Abner put into it. I can just imagine how the seraphim of religious life felt. I'm sure they loved Abner, but I know they worked with Paul because Paul was effective and Abner wasn't. I've always been sorry Nathaniel went to India because I think if he'd stayed in Jerusalem, he could have done some steering. I think Nathaniel could have bridled Peter's enthusiasm and kept something of the original gospel intact. Matthew. And I like Matthew. Matthew was a businessman. I've always been glad there was one businessman among the twelve. Matthew was a tax collector, and if you'll recall, in those days, taxes were farmed out as a concession. You paid the government so much for the right to collect taxes. The government had its revenue, and it was up to you to recoup what you'd paid. And human nature being what it is, the tax collector really put a squeeze on the people. Being a tax collector in those days gave one a social position, somewhere, I would say, intermediate between a saloon keeper and a white slaver in American society. This was a very low-down occupation. And the, other, the, the others among the twelve weren't too keen about, the, about Matthew. Matthew was the only man with any financial means among the twelve. It was his job to go out and raise money it was his job to see to it that Judas' bag was kept full. And many times he wanted to hear what Jesus was teaching. So he would liquidate some of his property and make up for his deficiency in going out to raise funds. This was hard on Matthew. When he would sense that they disdained him as a person of lower social status, he did so badly want to tell them that many times it was his hard cash that bought the bread they ate that day. But he restrained himself, and as the papers say, he did so wish that Jesus knew 
And of course, Jesus knew all about it. Nathaniel was efficient, I mean, Matthew was efficient. He was dedicated. He was of a type that we would understand as a good, honest politician, but an intensely practical man, a man who could maneuver, a man who could wheel and deal in Texas terminology. As I recall, Matthew also was put to death, wasn't he? Dapper. What's that? Dapper. That was Simon Zelotes. Oh. He went down the aisle. I forgot. Let's see what happened to Matthew. He died in Thrace. Mm -hmm. Thomas was chosen by Philip. And Thomas is an interesting person. It's interesting to me to note that it was Thomas that Jesus paired with Nathaniel when he wanted two of the twelve to talk to Rodan. He picked the philosopher, that's understandable, but he backed him up with a scientist. Thomas was moody. Thomas had a fairly unpleasant disposition. I think it's so human that Thomas' wife was glad when he joined the Twelve, because he'd be away from home more, and this would make life easier on her. Uh, Thomas didn't fit into the Twelve too well, not for the reason that Matthew had trouble, but just because Thomas could be surly and moody. Peter complained to Jesus about Thomas on at least one occasion. Thomas thought precisely he had the only scientific mind among the twelve. He and John, I think, had the largest measure of courage because if you'll recall, whenever Jesus' conduct would appear to border on danger, Thomas would argue right to the end that they shouldn't do this. When Jesus would, would say that they were going to do it anyway because this hour had come, it was always Thomas who said, all right, let's go. Let's go and die with him. Philip doubted, but Thomas wanted logic. Philip's questions indicated the inability to adjust to an idea. Thomas' questions in indicated the desire for a logical comprehension of what this was all about. Philip's questions were the earmarks of a lack of imagination. In the case of Thomas, it was a scientist approaching the gospel of the kingdom. You'll recall Thomas uh, stayed with him. He made the grade. He died in Malta. Just as he was about to begin the writing of the Gospel according to Thomas, which never got written. We have old Simon Zelotes, <coughs> the patriot among the twelve. This man was a real patriot, and I think it's a tribute to Jesus that he held him as well as he did. He was the one that was always hoping that Jesus would sit on David's throne. I've forgotten who it was that got the swords at the tail end. Was it Simon Zelotes? What, at the defend Jesus? Yeah. It was Peter and Peter Simon. Jesus. Peter and Simon. Yeah. On Palm Sunday, Simon Zelotes was intoxicated because they were going in to take the city over. I can see Ty Simon Zelotes figured Jesus is going to sit on David's throne and I'm going to be Secretary of Defense in the Commonwealth of Israel. That's exactly the way he had it figured. And there isn't anything wrong with Simon's patriotism. We applaud Americans who feel that way. And if we had an army of occupation in the United States and the Messiah and the Christ had come here, 
it would have been very difficult for an American to have said, it's not important about these foreign soldiers. You just follow me. Don't worry about the fact that, your con that our country is occupied. Simon came awful close to not making it, I think. When Jesus was crucified and the whole thing was over and Simon's dream finally crashed, he simply took to his bed. He was not with the twelve, with the ten in Galilee. And then Simon drew no hope. Jesus had said to Peter, pointing to John, uh, suppose I should not suppose I should tell this man to tarry until I return. What is that to you? And since John didn't die for a long time, this statement came to be interpreted that Jesus would return in the lifetime of John Zebedee. And if he returned, this meant that the kingdom would come as they hoped it would come. Simon believed a myth. Simon Zelotes believed that Jesus' return was imminent. And Simon resurrected his fallen dream and put it back together again and lived a very useful life ministering to his fellow men all the time believing in the fiction that Jesus would return and that the kingdom would be restored and that someone was going to sit on David's throne and run the Romans into the Mediterranean. <coughs> you know, we decry evil and error. But if Simon Zelotes had not believed that error, maybe he never would have lived a useful life. This is a real mixture of good and evil, isn't it? The Alpheus twins were so much alike. They were, they were not Sib twins. They were identical twins. I remember when I first read about these twins, it shook me. It shook a little of my faith in Jesus. I just didn't see how he could have accepted those Alpheus twins. This is not how you build an organization. That's true. This is not how you build a business organization. And believe me, occasionally I find an Alpheus twin sitting in a seat of authority, and underneath him I find chaos, real chaos, real unhappiness, real compression, real claustrophobia among his lieutenants. Because he's domineering. But Jesus wasn't building a kingdom of this world. He was building the kingdom of heaven. And these 12 apostles had a function to perform. As we deduce their reaction to Jesus, we can get 12 different facets of Jesus. And each of these men gave Jesus an opportunity to show something of what God's love was like. And if he's going to really show how God, God loves all men, he needed at least one real stupid apostle. And he got two. And I think maybe it was better to have two. Because if there had been only one, he would have been so lonesome. But the twins could talk to each other. These twins, as the papers call them, men of one talent, I've grown to love as I've thought about them. From my state of initial shock when I realized that two of these twelve apostles had flunked the Mendel Wasserman test, I got to thinking about it, you know, they did so much better than so many of the twelve. When David Zebedee learned about the reports that Jesus was risen and came up to talk to the twelve, the twins were the only two who supported him. All the rest of them, all the rest of the smart guys, didn't believe. When the multitude looked at the twins 
and then heard that Jesus had rejected Matadormus as a member of the 70 evangelists. Here's a smart guy with a lot of money. Then they knew that Jesus was no respecter of persons. The twins were effective in handling the crowds because they were like so many of the people that were there. They fit. The twins had one quality which gave them charm, real charm. They knew they weren't very much and they felt cheerful about it. <laughs> if a person is limited and knows it, that's a charming trait, because he doesn't try to do too much. If he doesn't know it or pretends, well, what, how do they say affectation is the ridiculous attempt of the ignorant to appear wise, of the barren soul to appear rich. These twins were wholly free from affectation. These twins uh, teach me something in and of themselves, but their presence enables Jesus to teach us all something about people like this. I hope somebody paints the scene in Celsus Garden when each one of the apostles, save the twins, had talked alone with Jesus. For Peter was the lead man. You'll recall, he said, Master, it's not that I want to have secrets from my comrades, but we, we may get into a heated discussion, and you may rebuke me pretty harshly. And if there's no one there, I'll take it so much better. And Jesus says, Come on, Peter. They went to the far end of the garden, where it was private, and talked. And one by one, through the long night, they talked with Jesus. And finally, all save the twins had had this experience. And Andrew went over and, motioning to Jesus, pointed at the twins sleeping by the fire in their clothes. And he said, Master, shall I waken them? And Jesus looked down, and he smiled. He didn't sneer. He smiled. And he said, no, Andrew, let them sleep. They do very well. You remember they asked Jesus very few questions. One time they asked him a pretty profound question. And they were quite proud when they could tell by the expression on Andrew's face that their question had been well answered. But they didn't understand the answer. <laughs> That's one of the sweetest statements in all these papers. <coughs> the story of Judas is, is a darn tragic story. Judas was the only Judean among the twelve. I don't think that is a factor. Matthew was the only publican among the twelve. Judas was one of the two well-educated men among the twelve. But the fact that Nathaniel didn't betray Jesus proves that it's not education. Judas had an ego, but so did John. Judas could get his feelings hurt, but so could Peter. Judas was not the only one getting swords or conspiring to make Jesus king or this or that. He always had one or more of the twelve as an ally. I can, Judas had a pretty good intellectual grasp of Jesus' teachings. I can see only one difference between Judas and all of the other eleven. These eleven men came to love Jesus, and Judas never did. Judas had been spoiled 
He grew up thinking in curves instead of trying to think in straight lines. Judas was a rationalizer. Judas was also a great executive. He was a stickler for procedure. He was a good treasure. He was very honest. Judas wanted to be great in the kingdom. And he didn't understand that greatness is a function of goodness, not a position. Judas wanted status. When he saw that he couldn't get status, the kind of status he wanted in the new kingdom, he decided to maneuver for status in the old kingdom, the commonwealth. And so he went to the Jewish Senate, the Sanhedrin, the board of, well, they, they were a cross between a senate, the aldermen of Jerusalem, and the College of Cardinals. It was a, it's an odd mixture. It was a theocracy, you know. When he sold Jesus down the river, he expected to be honored with a seat in the Sanhedrin. And we all know what he did when they gave him the price of a good, healthy slave for his betrayal of Jesus. And he took his own life. Judas' maneuverings were well known to the chief of the intelligence corps, who is one of my very favorite citizens, David Zebedee. I'm so glad these papers resurrected him from oblivion. No one told David to set up a messenger service, but he did. David's core of runners could reach from Damascus to Alexandria. He had relay runners. Now this man was a real organizer. You stop and think how many men it took in relays to cover that distance. This was the first social repercussion of Jesus' gospel, was the organization of David's core of communication. He was so level-headed. I always think of him when Jesus and the Twelve Fred fled a little prematurely from Capernaum thinking that the agents of Philip Triconifus were on their heels. You know, Philip was Herod's brother. He ruled. Let's see. He ruled in Perea. And they're in the boat. It's another picture that should be painted. Jesus and the twelve in the boat with Philip out there up to his waist, shaking hands with Jesus, saying goodbye. You remember what he said? He said, good boy, master. Don't let the bigots catch you. And he said, don't worry about us. With the relay runners, we'll keep in touch with you. We'll know where you are. And he said, don't worry about me. If they get me, I've got a second in command, even a third in command. The last week in Jerusalem, David used his runner corps as an espionage system. He had a tail watching every move that Judas made. He knew exactly the plot that was unfolding. He and John Mark had appointed themselves to watch over Jesus. John, being a boy, strayed a little from his station because he wanted to hear everything that was going on. John almost got caught that night. David was watching where is it up the book Kedron there? It was David Zebed David Zebedee was the only human being 
who said goodbye to Jesus. He was the only one who really believed that Jesus was going to die on this trip to Jerusalem. I think the attitude of the other apostles is well summarized by the comment which even Nathaniel or Thomas said to Rodan when one said, he even now speaks of his death, some mystical reference to his future glorification. They knew Jesus couldn't die. But David listened, and he took Jesus literally. David sought Jesus out that night, just before he was arrested, and bid him goodbye. And he said, Master, he said, I'll always remember you. And I will always enjoy having work with you. And Jesus said, David, he said, others have done that which they were told to do. But all these things you have done on your own initiative. That episode was followed when he asked David, he said, have you got a good runner? David said, yes. And I believe the name of the runner was Jacob. And David, Jesus sent him out on his way to Philadelphia with a message for Abner to the effect that he, Jesus, was about to be put to death, but not to worry, that he would soon see Abner. Here's a man about to submit himself to a few temple guards and a few Roman soldiers. And the tremendous physical power which he could command is just suggested by his promise to Jacob. He said, Jacob, he said, you're going up the bloody way at night. But he said, tonight, do not worry. An unseen runner goes by your side. David's intelligence car wasn't idle. Jesus hadn't appeared to very many people before David knew all about it. And he went to visit the twelve. I guess they were in hiding in the upper chamber of the home of Elijah and Mary Mark in Jerusalem. And I, I can imagine his surprise, or maybe he wasn't too surprised, when he discovered that none of the twelve, save the twins, believed that Jesus had risen. And he talked to them, including his two brothers, and then he made that memorable statement in which he said, all right, you boys are the ambassadors of the kingdom, and you ought to understand these things. I'm just the chief of the messenger corps. But I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to assemble this corps and send them out with the last message they'll ever carry. And the message which they're going to carry to all the believers is this. Jesus is risen. The tomb is empty. And I'm disbanding the corps. I like to see a, paint, a picture painted of this, too. I like to see David, I guess it was in the home of Joseph of Arimathea, wasn't it? Nicodemus was there. Many of the women believers were there. I like to see David with this bunch of runners lined up as he gives them this last message and sends them out on their final channel. This to me was the 13th apostle. And I've always been sorry they didn't pick him in Judah's place. And I've always been glad to know how he ended. There was one member of Jesus' family who would have nothing to do with the family conspiracy to muffle Jesus. And that was the youngest member, Ruth. And to me, it is singularly appropriate that David married her. You remember they moved to Philadelphia? 
and were joined there by Lazarus. Nathaniel stopped there on his way to India. Why don't we have a coffee break, then? You know, we're not working tonight. We're playing.
solitary messenger. And speaking of adjusters, says, no one, I know no one, but wouldn't delight to be host to a thought adjuster. This thing is hard to understand. It's hard for me to understand how Jesus got here. But the author of the paper dealing with these, the world of the Father, says, the evolution of the immortal soul, its fusion with the adjuster, and the making of these two antipodal creatures, one being, is a great mystery to us. Now, he said, obviously, it's not a mystery to you, because all ascending is open to you. But there's a sector of ascending him that's forever closed to me. And he said, furthermore, it's interesting to observe that you never tell us how this happened. He said, I don't know whether you cannot. I only know that you do not. This thought adjuster, like personality, has got the potential for all future time in it. This is a gas tank that's, to all practical intents and purposes, spiritually bottomless. I think the best definition of personality that's given in these papers is permanence in the presence of change. That appears in the last two lines of the first paragraph. And how can our personalities be unchanging when we change so? Well, let's look at it this way. Let's compare a human being to a necklace of beads.